Hi everyone, this is David with John 17 Project. So, if this is your first time here, welcome. If it's not your first time here, welcome back. Please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, comment, share, all those good things. So, continuing my, well, the series I've been doing on uh, the road to unity. Last... Last uh, couple of videos were about the great schism between the Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, obviously, that was something that was a little more complicated, took more time than just 1054. But kind of got into some of that, and I talked about how our Catholic brothers and sisters can start, an Orthodox Catholic brothers and sisters and Orthodox brothers and sisters can start coming back together. Of course, that includes the Oriental Orthodox brothers and sisters as well. So, um, this week I'm going to do start, well, next few videos, including this one, we're going to really start talking about the next big thing, which was, of course, the Protestant Reformation. Now, I'm going to preface these videos a little bit. So, here's the preface. One, um, I am not trying to, uh, offend anyone. It's not my goal to do so. I think that some people will get offended and probably already have been by some of these videos and that's okay because the reality is, is that we need to be caring more about Christ than our particular camp and de denomination and, and be humble, 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 humble. That's really, I think, the number one thing when it comes to unity is humility um, coming back together because we're all wrong in something doctrinally, theologically. We all have something wrong because we're human beings and we're imperfect in this. And all the denominations are wrong. Conversely, everyone who is a Bible-believing God-fearing, trying to walk out in holy, biblical faith is also right about a lot of things. But we need to be having grace for one another as well as truth. You know, I, I've uh, been talking with other believers about unity and um, online lately and there's, a, there's something that I notice, and there's a big contrast in our society, with, in, in the church. Um, and it's a basically a, it's extremes, which our society apparently loves that these days. Let's go extreme one way or extreme another, and, you know, one of those two options is right, nothing in the middle, or both and solutions, you know, thinking to any of this is wrong. But with, with walking with the Lord, it's very often a both and, and seldom an either or. What I mean by that is, you take the example of the extreme grace, which we see in the West a lot. It probably happens in other parts of the world, but since I'm in the United States and more familiar with the West and what, how churches are in the West um, and how, the, well, the body of Christ is in the West, the extreme grace is a problem. And it's been taken to the extreme of let's disregard sin and excuse sin. And not everybody's taken it that far, but there's a lot of that. Um, part of the problem with that is this. There's a lie in the West that a lot of people have believed. Um, and it's the, it goes like this. You'll hear it all the time. People are basically good. That is nonsense. People basically suck. People have the capacity to suck or be good. People are just basically broken. But we all have the capacity to do good and, and terrible things. But good is a word thrown away around way too much. 
and people are not basically good. In the West, we've become so comfortable, and with the extreme grace, it, you know, forgiving your sins, and you don't need to worry about it anymore, and no repentance involved in that. It's all, all the forgiveness of sins, but there's no talk of repentance. Then you got the extreme grace going on. On the other end of the spectrum, the extreme, you have those that are all about nothing but truth. Truth, 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 truth. But, and they just want to pound people in the head with their theology and their doctrine. And that's equally wrong. Scripture says that the Lord was that the Lord was filled with grace and truth. Full of grace, full of truth. He was he had all grace, all truth at the same time. Just like he had all holiness, all love, all justice, all mercy going on. Those things are not opposed to one another. This is a both and situation, not an either or. We need to be full of grace and truth. Those just as the Lord was. And if we start veering too far into it's all grace or it's all truth, that's dangerous in either direction. So don't, don't, uh, I I would encourage all of you brothers and sisters to be very careful. We're all going to veer off one way or another in one, one thing or another because we are not able to perfectly do that in our own strength. But this is what the Holy Spirit's power is for. To help us in those ways. And this is what the other part thing we're supposed to be doing is being in fellowship and part of a, the body is for because we're supposed to be iron sharpening iron, holding each other up, lifting each other up, encouraging one another, coming alongside one another. Because none of us have got this on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit and we need each other to walk this out and to call each other out when we're off. And to lift each other up and encourage each other when we're off too. So let's be careful of extremes. Because when I'm going to be talking about the Reformation here in these videos over the next, I don't know if I'm going to do two or three, I'm going to get into it a bit because there's some major issues of division within it. But as I'm getting into it, let's just remember that we need to have grace with those we disagree with and love for those we disagree with in the body and mercy. Yes, stand on truth, but not, but not free of love, not free of grace. Be holy, but again, not free of love, not free of grace, not free of mercy. So, yeah. That's my preface. So, give a little background. Uh, if you haven't really studied uh, the Reformation too much, obviously I'll be doing what I usually do, where I have some links below in the description. You can kind of follow into it and get into it yourself. So, now, a lot of people are familiar with the basics of the Reformation. Martin Luther, um, the 95 you know, statements that he nailed to the wall of the, or the door of the church. But a lot of it is missing. How did things get there? One. Uh, what happened when it began? What were the, what happened afterwards? And what were the final results that affect us today? Well, there's pretty much my four videos. Um, so what led up to it? Let's start with this one. A lot of what led up to it was political power in the hands of the papacy, military power in the hands of the papacy, and a bunch of corruption because absolute power corrupts. That level of power corrupts. Human beings, there are very few who can rule and, and have a level of power that they would be righteous enough not to abuse it. It's very difficult. Um, in history, you can actually point to the... It's easier to find the few that uh, weren't corrupt than it is to, 
to look at all the ones that were because by far and away the ones that were corrupt outweigh the ones that weren't so you know uh you know if you want to look at uh something in in a in our context in in the US history uh George Washington versus King George of that time that there's a there's a a, a very big difference uh, corruption being George, uh, King George and, and uh and George Washington being one who was very principled and that even, and even when people wanted to make him king he refused and gave back his power and stepped down so there's there's exactly you know there's very few examples and that's why we can point them out like that but the papacy unfortunately there were some bad popes who got involved in uh, horrific things and there was a lot of bad doctrine and there were a lot of bad practices going on uh, the selling of indulgences uh prostitution, being involved with clergy. I mean, it was just, the sin was really, really rampant, the corruption. And it was, it was interesting because the whole thing about the indulgences and a lot of the stuff about uh, where people would pay money for prayers and things of that sort that were going on, just kind of thought of this, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of the, uh, the really bad um, prosperity gospel uh, televangelists who ask you to send them money for whatever. Uh, it's that kind of corruption. Um, it's, it's really awful. I mean, it's obviously packaged differently now than it was then, but it's the same kind of horrible um, corruption and evil and sin. And obviously Martin Luther after seeing that when he went to Rome. Although I will note this, he wasn't seeing it that to that level where he was at. So that's something interesting to note that in a lot of local areas that wasn't going on, but that obviously was going on at the higher levels and it was going on to some degree at the local level. Not to the degree that he saw it when he went to Rome, which is what caused him to get full of some righteous indignation and right the 95 statements and nail them to the church door. Martin Luther called out the church, called out them for the sin. And quite honestly, I think he was started in the right, on the right foot. Um, he didn't end up on the right foot, unfortunately. And we'll get to that, but he did start on the right foot. Oh, I think I might have to sneeze. Okay. Maybe not. Okay. Sorry, I was debating whether I need to pause the video for a second because I thought I might have to sneeze. And I didn't want uh, want everybody to see or hear that. Anyway, so obviously we many of us know what happens. I'm just doing a, kind of a little overview. We'll get it deeper into it. Um, we know that uh, he was called out as a heretic. They tried to kill him a couple times. He finally had to escape and uh, was being uh, protected by um, an aristocrat in Germany. And things kind of went from there. My view on the Reformation as a whole, I'm going to talk about this for a minute because I think this is important for everyone watching to know where I'm coming from. I don't call myself a Protestant anymore. I grew up in Protestant churches and I've been in many Protestant denominations um, in my lifetime, largely from just moving around. Um, but I don't consider myself Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox. Judeo-Christian Judeo maybe would be a way to say it, I guess. I'm, I think I'm kind of post-label at this point. Um, and it's not because I don't agree with many of the, um, doctrine or theological points of Protestant, uh, belief, but it's because of the horrific 
hatred for the Jewish people that uh, those leaders like Luther and Calvin and their followers had and the horrific stuff that happened. And I don't want to be associated with that. I don't want to bear the name of a the Reformation that uh, had so much horrific results involved in it. And people will say, maybe I'm throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I'm not throwing out the baby with the bathwater because I didn't throw out all the beliefs I have held. But I am going to not associate personally, I'm not going to call myself a Protestant because of the horrific and terrible things that happened um, at the behest of those leaders. And it grieves me when I, when I learned about it. This is something I've obviously talked about in other videos a little bit, but I just want everybody to know where I was coming from on this. So one of the other things uh, about the Reformation, this is something I didn't think about till I was, uh, was actually listening to, I'm trying to remember the scholar's name. I may actually, um, there was an interview on Remnant Radio with a, with a scholar who was talking about the Reformation. And he made a really good point, and I never thought about it from this perspective before. And I may, I'll may i probably link the, the video um, so that everybody can watch it. But he made a really good point about the, the Reformation, that it was very reactionary. And that that's not really a good thing. And what his point was, is that a lot of the thinking and theology and doctrine was basically in a we don't want to be anything like those terrible, awful Catholics. So we're going to make our doctrine and theology very, very opposed and very, very much different than that. So that we can basically call them heretics and we're right and they're wrong. And it's a mindset and an attitude that's very dangerous because it sets you up to... Um, to trust in your own thinking and wisdom instead of saying, okay, what has the, the church gotten right over time? Well, let's stick with that. And what the has the church gotten wrong? Calvin, I would say, was the worst at the reactionary versus Luther. They both were. So was Zwingli. The whole, all the reformers were. <clears throat> To, uh, to some extent, but uh, Calvin would probably be, been the one that that uh, that was the most reactionary to it, which is kind of strange since he ended up having an inquisition of his own and burning a bunch of people at the stake. But anyway, uh, but yeah, so the reactionary parts of and attitudes and thinking of, of the Reformation are not not really a good thing. It ends up putting you in an opposition to it and you're doing things out of opposition instead of being, I'm for Scripture and here's what Scripture says and let's be honest and open and objective in our own minds as much as we can be to what Scripture is saying and go with that. Instead, it was... This is what they're teaching. Let's do something really kind of opposite of that. It's very reactionary that way. Which is kind of funny that that happened because after the, the Reformation really got going, the Catholic Church reformed as well. And they had the Catholic Reformation where they got rid of a bunch of that sin and really addressed a lot of horrific stuff that was going on in the, in the church and really uh, came out better. Uh, by far than before. So, you know, there was that, there was good in that, 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 uh, eventually the, um, the calling out of the sin was addressed. Some will argue that they didn't do it perfectly and all this, but you know what? It's really sad because even Martin Luther said that he wished he'd just been able to stay in part of the church so he could have helped 
be part of the re reform to fix it from the inside and there could still be union and unity. Um, so even he recognized that there was the division was not a good thing. So that's just kind of the overview uh, of where we're going in the next few videos. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to talk some more about, obviously, things that uh, happened right after Re the Reformation. We're going to be discussing, you know, what happened, uh, what its effects were, what its effects are now, and how can we overcome the division of it and, and deal with it. So that's where we'll go uh, from here. I will link a couple things below specifically uh, so that people can um, start reading a little bit about the history of it. So brush up on that. And then um, I will actually post that interview uh, from Remnant Radio's page so that people can watch that one. Because that, that was a very some very good points made by that. But that's specifically about being reactionary was very... Um, very spot on, I thought. So, anyway, um, it's kind of a shorter video, only about a little over 20, 21 minutes, 22 minutes, somewhere around there this week. And uh, we'll get into more nitty gritty next week. I hope everyone has a great weekend and a great Sabbath. And uh, yeah, if you uh, please like, subscribe, uh, hit the notification bell, all those things. Share, comment, all that. And I will see everybody next week and we'll begin discussing the Protestant Reformation. This is David with John 17 Project. See you later.